This week on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, we're continuing our discussion on air-to-air tactics, not just on the various missions, but also on the planning factors and mindset, as you will learn from our guest, a current Marine Fighter Attack Squadron commanding officer. And I can tell you this much, when I get up and stand in front of my ready room and talk to my pilots, I remind them all the time that right now, in some far off land, there is a young pilot and his job is to train to kill you. So what are you doing about it? This is the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat. The aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here are your hosts, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilots, Vincent Aiello and Brian Sinclair. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. This is episode 32. We're talking air-to-air missions today. I am Jello, And I'm Sunshine. And that voice you heard in our intro bumper is my 11-year-old son, Dawson. Way to go, Dawson. Yeah, he recorded that for me last night. He was very serious sounding <laughs> for an 11-year-old, but <laughs> he did a good job, and he stole some quarters off my nightstand as payment, so I think he's going to enjoy listening to himself. Anyway, we will get to our interview in just a bit, but how are you doing, bud? I am doing well, Jello, enjoying the retired life, but most importantly, how did Mickey treat you? Well, Orlando was good. We had a fun but exhausting time. I think you said something similar when you returned <laughs> back in September. You know, you get in late to your room, you get up early because you got to make the rope drop for a certain ride or you got to fast pass, and it's busy and tiring and expensive, but you know, it's fun to see the light in the eyes of your kids, so it's worth it. Totally invaluable experience, I agree. Yep, for sure. All right, so before we get to the interview, let's cover a couple announcements, and I think we'll have time for some listener questions. Perfect. All right. So first off, some corrections from last episode. So I think both of us had a misspeak. Mine (laughs) was I said the E2 AWACS and, of course, meant the E3. Yeah, so my Mia culpa, as I call it, was uh, pointed out by Mr. Anthony Gifford. So thank you very much. I believe he's across the pond there. He's British. And he helped me realize or correct me that uh, Michael Faraday is indeed British, not French. And his Ah. last name is spelled with one R. Okay. So so sorry to snub the Brits there. My apologies. Well, no problem. We put Faraday correctly spelled on our glossary tab. So if people want to link to that and check it out, they can. And so, yeah, no big deal. We don't claim to be perfect, as I always say. By no means. No, This is an amateur show. And I love feedback, and especially when I'm wrong. (laughs) Well, there you go. And speaking of feedback, we are trying out a new microphone that we bought. Yes, it's it's fancy. Yeah, it's pretty nice. And so who knows what the audio will sound like. We're experimenting here, folks. And we're also trying to get Sunshine, what we call safe for solo in Mm -hmm. aviation parlance. That is so he can use these microphones and his laptop and go off on his own and record some interviews, perhaps. Yeah, who? then we can use those on future episodes. All right. Well, the last episode was such a big hit with Niles and comms that we are scheduled to meet tomorrow on the 28th to record a encore bonus episode that I think we're just going to put on Patreon because our supporters are generous enough to make the show keep going. And so we're going to give them a little bonus on what actual calls No Kidding sound like. So I spent about an hour yesterday geeking out on PowerPoint, just like the good old days at Top Gun. (laughs) And I built different slides, and I think we'll do this one in both audio and video so people can see it. And when I click to the slide, he will make the No Kidding call. Single group, rock, 270, 10. Oh, 20. I see what you're so, yeah. so add gonna, visual to it. Yep, and that That's way the folks dimension. can see it, and then they can hear it, and it will be the no kidding, same exact calls that he could have given either one or both of us sometime in the past when we flew with him. If picture's worth a thousand words, video is worth how many words? Oh, gosh, I yeah. don't know. Is it, well, you tell me, Mr. Engineer. <laughs> <laughs> a thousand of the ten or something. I don't know. Maybe it's logarithmic. <laughs> and then also, as always, we like to 
identify our Patreon supporters mm-hmm. who have joined since the last episode. We have three this week. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, proud to announce our new division lead, Austin Wright. Nice. We have a new strike lead, Tormod Hansen, and a new mission commander, which is the $50 level, and that's Luigi, and we'll just leave it at that. He didn't really want a whole lot of attention or oh, okay. any of the perks, frankly. Yeah. He was just happy to support us at that level, so that's cool. Thank you, Tormod and Luigi. You betcha, and Austin. So, anyway, we are happy for your support, and we just appreciate that you come along and help keep the show going, but also that you get the exclusive content that is only available on Patreon, like the upcoming Calm examples. All right, what do you say we jump into some questions? I think it's a great idea. You want to start off with Nick's question? Yeah, but before I do, I want to mention that I, you know, I keep getting my rear end kicked by technology. Oh. I had two questions downloaded from phone calls okay and when i went back to check them later they weren't in the same format anymore i don't know what happened and i could not go back into grasshopper which is the service i use and find them so those of you out there waiting for your phoned in question one of them was on smoking i don't remember the other one okay but if you called in recently and i have not played it please call back and leave it again and i will try to do a better job of backing up i think i've said before technology is not my strong suit i may need to hand some of this technology (laughs) stuff to you well as i get older i diverge quickly from oh, very good. Too. Yeah, All right. Sorry. So anyway, yes, Nick Matviev, we've talked about him before. He is one of our Patreon section leads. And his question is, would you say the majority of your colleagues were drawn to the service more by the flying aspect, e.g. speed maneuvering, or the combat aspect, i.e. tactics or engagements? What do you think, Sunshine? I would tend toward the flying aspect. So a lot of the movies you see growing up prior to getting engaged in the confidential levels, especially of tactics engagements, you know, you can't wet your whistle if you don't know about it. So going back to the movies, sorry, in high school, junior high, all that, it's going to be about the fantastic shots, going to an air show, seeing the speed, feeling right. the feeling the heat, you know, hearing the sounds and all that. So I'm going to go with the flying aspect. How yeah, about you, Jello? I would agree with that. I've never really thought of this question per se. I mean, I think people join military aviation because they have a love of flying and it just calls to them. And it probably is more the speed and maneuvering, as Nick puts it, than the actual tactics of it. But like anything, once you get good at something, you want to challenge. And so you come into it for the sake of flying, but pretty soon... To be able to do the air-to-air or close air support or whatever, it is very much like a puzzle or a challenge. And Mm. so you can apply your craft to get better at dogfighting or whatever. And so I would say maybe you come in for the speed and maneuvering, but you stay really because of the people, as I've said on the show before. But specifically, you enjoy just the, the missions that you can fly, which we'll talk about today, actually. Perfect. Yeah, I agree with you. Excellent. All right. Next, let's go to a phone call. Hi, this is Austin from uh, Boise, Idaho. I just had a question regarding the original companies that produced the airframes that you guys flew. Is it pretty common for the companies, so let's say Boeing, are there company representatives ever out in the uh, carrier strike group? Or do you guys have some sort of middleman? Thanks. Really enjoy the show. All right, Austin, interesting question. I don't ever remember any Boeing reps or Grumman in the sake of the E-2, and I don't even know who makes the H-60. Sikorsky, I guess. Sikorsky, yeah. I don't remember any of the manufacturer representatives on the ship, although they were at our stations. I know they were in in Mm Lemoore. And there were, however, what we used to call tech reps, technical representatives, I suppose, that were present for specifically the FLIR, the forward-looking infrared. I remember those guys out there, and I think it was because it was a bit of a finicky system, so they wanted to be the experts on site to make sure they worked correctly because they were so important for our missions. But do you remember any Boeing guys out on your deployments? No, I don't. Just like okay. you said, Lemoore. Also, when I was in VX, so a test and evaluation, we mm-hmm. had the, the Boeing test pilots there and also the tech reps. But it's predominantly for the subsystems as opposed to the airframe. Right. Okay. Good question. Why don't you take the next one? Sure. Hey, this one's from Jordan McVeigh, who's a Patreon division lead. Yay. Jordan asks, how important was simulator time when in training and then later in your career? Oh, boy. Well, I would say it's vital in training Yeah. and less important later. But, you know, I think we have talked about this on the show somewhere before. Your academic progress, if you will, through flight school or your, just your progress begins with academics and then the simulator and then the airplane. So it is 
critical. It's essential. It's required. And then when you get done with your training and you show up to your squadron, you're not done learning, of course. Much of the qualification progression you will do as a wingman and then a section lead and then a division lead, you do some of those missions first in the simulator. Absolutely. I would say the simulator to me, Jello, is more of a procedures training mm -hmm. or trainer, excuse me. So you're looking at kind of the human factors of, hey, this switch is over here. If you want to call it proprioceptive or tactile feedback, whatever. Right. But, hey, this, this switch is over here because you, as you know, as you full well know, during flying, you don't have time to look down for things. So you have right. to have muscle memory, know where things are. Right. So uh, it also uh, the, the visual cues of, hey, here's what I need to look at for this part of the mission. Here's what I need to look at for a separate part of the mission. So that, that would wrap itself up into the procedures training. Yeah, and in tactics, we would sometimes go jump in the simulator before doing it. Did you guys ever do that in test, I wonder? Did you ever do like a simulator run for a flight you were going to do? We would, absolutely, oh, cool. dry runs, because it is a lot cheaper than right. renting an airplane and going on with a bunch of gas and trying to get a mission done. So simulators, to Jordan's question, are vital at the beginning for training and then later for fine-tuning, I would say. But also, we had at least one simulator, actually two every year, right? We had our annual NATOPS check, which was our make sure you still know the aircraft systems well and can handle emergencies. And the other one was the annual instrument check. Yeah. I'm sorry. One other thing to add from the test aspect is we have something that we're now incorporating as a cost-saving measure, and that's LVC, or live virtual constructor uh, yes and with the virtual part of it so live is real metal in the air burning real gas making noise virtual is going to be a simulator so someone on the ground and they're tied into the uh the network we'll call it as okay. the mids or the scenario yeah the mm -hmm. scenario there you go and then c constructive is actually going to be a computer-based kind of um a bad guy just by insert hey here's an air altitude and airspeed and you go and a computer runs it so okay. the simulators are also very important for that lvc which is once again cost effective training right. measures and you know they're not just doing that in training by the way they're doing that up in fallon because the range is so busy all the time plus it's hard to get professional adversaries and so as part of the training when air wings go to fallon i don't know if they're doing it yet for top gun or the other weapon schools but they are doing or at least incorporating lvc into the future training up in fallon so, very cool yeah there you go all right and then let's see louis ferrer asks how do you train to prevent confusion and shooting down the wrong person during a heated multi-aircraft dogfight Ah, well, I'll tell you what, three little letters, Jello, I-F-F, -F, as in identify friend foe. So I immediately think of our mode four systems, and soon we have got the mode five coming online. Mm -hmm. But since earlier, if you don't mind, since I snubbed the Brits or the British folks <laughs> with the uh, Faraday comment, I got to give a shout out to a British uh, Robert Watson Watt. And he huh. actually had a patent for IFF back in 1935. Wow. Yeah, so he had a very different system than what we had today, as you can imagine. So it's based, uh, basically back in the early 30s, they had radar came out, right? Okay. And then I kind of think of it more of being operationally relevant in World War II, where the right. British, you know, kind of watching their coast. But back then, he actually had a series of dipole antennas that would resonate at a certain frequency. So the good guys, if you will, on the radar display would actually look brighter than the rest of the guys. Wow. So it's kind of neat. So anyway, there's the shout out to the Brits. Uh, hopefully, Anthony, you're okay with that. <laughs> See, this is why I'm glad I brought you on this show, because you have all these little nuggets of information <laughs> in my caveman head I don't have. So that, that's pretty interesting. But it's sometimes more than just that. I mean, so if you and I are dogfighting and I get a lock on you, or let's make it fair, you get a lock on me, uh, <laughs> more likely, uh, your symbology in the heads-up display may quickly change if the interrogator interrogates me mm -hmm. and gets a certain response. But I think to Louis's question, that isn't always necessarily the case, or maybe you're just not looking in the heads-up display, although I never use the helmet, the joint helmet. Does uh -huh. the same symbology show up in there? Yeah, there's, okay. there's no color so, differentiation. There's no color there. Yeah, but still, so yeah. I guess to his point, though, you know, and especially in the old days when you and I started, it really came down to situational awareness, mm -hmm. aircraft identification. In other words, is that an F-18 or is that a MiG-29 or whatever, F-5 in the case of training, maybe? And what color is it? Is it where I expect my wingman to be? And then we have standardized communications for status high-low. In other mm -hmm. words, I see two aircraft and I see them vertically. Are you the high one or the low one? Not just status and leave it up to him to try to figure out, oh, I'm the one turning left. Well, you're both yeah. turning left. You know, So <laughs> you give him a status yeah. call with what you see and he tries to answer that. Or when in doubt, you just don't shoot. 
Because better to be wrong and not shoot, I would argue. Than fratricide. Yes. And yeah. we have definitely talked about that before on the so, show. Yeah, and Jelly, you bring up good points. So if Louis specifically talking about the within visual range arena, mm-hmm. spot on. Yeah, I'm sorry. The IFF, Louis is going to be more for a BVR beyond visual right. range. Yeah, well, he did say in a multi dog fight. dogfight. So yeah. I assumed in the visual. Yeah, but that, you're, that's a good point. And again, if you get a quick lock on someone, it will often change very quickly the symbology based on if it's identifiable by the aircraft as a friend or an enemy. Yeah. Louis, to your point, though, it is difficult to do, and that is why we train so much. All right, bud. Well, I think we better get to the interview with Snotty, and I think the listeners are really going to enjoy this. This was one of the... Well, I guess there's a lot of interviews that do this, but I was fired up at the end of this thing, and I totally even made great. a comment. I was totally ready to get back and, and jump in, and Snotty's an awesome guy. I think everyone will enjoy it. There is a section, I've tried to edit it out the best I could. There is a section where, once again, a little bit of sound issues and audio quality plague us. We are working on it. We're really sorry, but we need to leave it in there for context, as well as we figured, even in its decrepit state, better than nothing. Hopefully you'll enjoy it, and hopefully you'll forgive us. There is also an analogy I make with the Secret Service that I want to tell you up front. I end up using the wrong terms. When I say screen, I meant sweep. And when I say uh, screen, I meant close escort. So there's some confusion in there. Uh, Basically, I meant to go from sweep to screen to close escort as I talk about the various bodyguards next to the president. So when you hear that, hopefully that will make sense. I tried to just like cut words and like redo it, but it was, I was talking in a stream of conscious like I am now, and it was really (laughs) hard to change the words. So I figured I'll just correct everyone instead. So anyway, uh, unless you got anything, let's get straight to the interview. Giddy up. Okay. All right, today the Fighter Pilot Podcast is in Rancho Penasquitas, California, just north of San Diego, and we are joined by United States Marine Corps Lieutenant Colonel Mark Bortnam, call sign Snotty. Hello. Snotty, welcome. Oh, it's great to be here. Good. Well, we're glad to have you on the show. Today we are talking about air-to-air missions, and I believe you're qualified to talk about this. Tell us real quickly your background, where you're from, where you went to college, and what are you doing now? Okay. I grew up in uh, southeastern lower Michigan, so I grew up in a little town called Milford, and then when I was older, moved to a small town called Howell. Let's see, in 1987, I quit high school and then spent a couple years there kind of milling about, not really doing anything before I finally decided that the path in life for me was to join the Marine Corps. So enlisted in the Marine Corps in 1991. Uh, and then uh, eventually was promoted a couple times and selected for the uh, MESEP program, which is an enlisted commissioning program. After that, I went to school at uh, Ohio State University in uh, Columbus, Ohio, had a uh, tremendous time there, and, uh, and then was commissioned uh, later on in 1998. So uh, from commissioning, I went um, down to Quantico to the basic school, and when it was time to select jobs, uh, I kind of picked the job that I thought sounded the best, the one that was going to keep me out of from behind a desk. And that was to fly the backseat of an F-18. And so I went down to Pensacola, further on uh, training here in San Diego, and eventually found my way into a Marine Corps squadron in Beaufort, South Carolina, where I spent an entire tour there, went to combat in uh, 2005 in Iraq, and eventually decided that being in the back wasn't quite as fun as what it seemed like being in the front would be. So I applied for a transition uh, was selected for that in 2006, went back to flight school. So I went to flight school twice, not, not necessarily recommended. And then, <laughs> uh, and then eventually became an F-18 pilot in 2009. So I've been an F-18 pilot ever since, both in Miramar. I was an exchange officer in the Royal Canadian Air Force for a couple of years, did that 2014 to 2016. And now I'm actually the commanding officer of the Marine Corps' oldest and most decorated fighter squadron, VMFA 232, the Red Devils. Outstanding. So you've been an enlisted Marine, an NFO, and a pilot. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's correct. It's a mouthful. I've had uh, right. just about every job you can have. Okay. Well, you are eminently qualified then to talk about this. Just real quick, what was your MOS as an enlisted man? I was a 3043, and that is a supply operations clerk. Oh, wow. And so I worked in a sweaty warehouse in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. <laughs> so I knew pretty quickly I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. Okay. And then just real quickly, MESEP, what does that stand for? MESEP. It stands for Marine Enlisted Commissioning Education Program. Okay. We have a list of terms on our website. And so we'll add that one to it as well. And we'll probably have a couple others here. All right. So Snotty, you are the man, man. You have done a lot. And today you are going to grace us with a discussion on air-to-air missions. So of course, some caveats are in order. 
you and I know a lot more than we can talk about. That's right. And both from a time point of view and a classification point of view, we have to keep this you know, fairly quick and fairly vanilla. But I thought what we would do for today is talk in broad terms about the different types of missions and then describe some of the subset missions of those and then some mission planning factors. And then we always end up with what's the future hold for you and how did you get your call sign? So let's start right off then with why have air-to-air missions? I mean, what's the point of this discussion, really? So first off, let me just touch on uh, something you talked about, about classification. Okay. Frankly, a discussion about air-to-air missions is pretty easy to have without even getting into the classified realm, just simply because most of the stuff is known to the world. True. And we've been fighting air-to-air missions since airplanes were a thing. You know, you're talking way back in World War One and World War Two. most of it developed in World War Two, and then you can have that fundamental discussion about where air-to-air tactics truly came from, and that was the development uh, that led us to Top Gun in Vietnam. Uh, And so this is really an an outcropping of that. So if you're talking about the two general missions, one of them would be called OCA and one of them would be called DCA. So OCA is offensive counter air and DCA is defensive counter air. And fundamentally, one of them is I'm going to somebody else's land to attack them and attack their airplanes. And the other one would be I'm protecting something from someone else coming to attack me. True. And then a third category might be, and it's a blend of the two, is the high value airborne asset protection or have a P. So I misled you on that question a little bit as far as the the first one being why have air-to-air missions. Not that I misled you, but I didn't give you a chance to respond to the other stuff. And and so I think the point is simply that in the combat arms realm, soldiers find ways to fight on the land, on the sea, under the sea, and above the sea. And if the president gets his way, pretty soon space. So this is just another way that countries wage war effectively. It is. It is not only that, but if you think about it, so we have, like you mentioned, uh, you know, sea-based assets. We have ground-based assets. Space. We already have space-based sure, assets, sure. and then we have our kind of airborne-based assets. Generally speaking, airborne-based assets are the ones with the longest range, with the highest speed, and in some cases, the most bang for the buck, so to speak. Now, whether that's cruise missiles or airborne-launched uh, things like that. So, in other words, you need to have some sort of airborne protection either offensively or defensively, to be successful in today's battlefield. Because it is a part of the big battlefield. I don't know what else to call it than that. But, you know, if we can, as we've done for hundreds of years, control the seas, well, then we have a certain effect on a military or an opponent, I should say. And same with the skies. And we've demonstrated that in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in lots of other places. We've been fighting that war in Iraq and Afghanistan for 27 years. and And I think we have demonstrated there that air superiority and air dominance is critical to the success of any mission. For sure. All right. So let's start with OCA or offensive counter air. And we'll just kind of start with the one that is farthest out kind of on their own. And then we'll get closer and closer, if you will, to a protected element. And the first would be a sweep mission. So what can you tell us about a sweep? Well, I like the simple man theory. I like to make sure that I can define these missions in ways that my young pilots, especially the ones that have just gotten to the squadron, can understand the best. And, you know, when I talk about a sweep mission, it's the one where I don't have anyone else there with me. In other words, there's no strikers. There's nothing else I need to worry about. It's just me out there fighting other aircraft. And so that's really the bottom line of a sweep mission is it's air, airplanes versus airplanes. So it's about as OCA as you can get. Sure because is. Because you send an element, which could be generally no less than a section, which is a two ship, uh, two airplanes, but usually about a division or maybe more. And you're going out and you're basically looking for a fight. That's right. And you, you nailed it when you said, uh, when you talk about minimum forces, I think nowadays uh, we're probably talking a minimum is at least a four ship. More than likely, you're probably talking multi, multi airplanes. And, right. and I can tell you just from recent examples, we went up to do a, a very big exercise in Alaska called Red Flag. And, you know, for the Red Flag missions up there, there were probably anywhere from 12 to 20 or more aircraft doing sweep missions alone. And that discounted all the other aircraft that were doing other missions. Right. And so there was a lot of aircraft up there dedicated solely to finding and destroying other aircraft. Awesome. All right. So from a sweep, if you now, to your point, you said, hey, they're out on their own. They're not worried about strikers, which you and I understand is the term for people that are hauling bombs, which in the old days was a dedicated airplane. Sure. And that was an A6 or an A7, and they needed protection. These days, it's just another one of us. It could be you in the sweep, and it could be me back there hauling bombs, but I still have missiles. Using the same airplane. In the same airplane, Right. right? Not the exact 
same one. But now if you attach those fighters a little closer out in front, separated by an amount of time or distance, now we call that a screen. So tell us a little bit about that mission. You nailed it when you started talking about whether it's distance or whether it's time. And a screen is now tied to something else. So in other words, it's exactly like you would think a football analogy or maybe a screen for any other reason. What we're trying to do in that case is to attrite or reduce the amount of enemy aircraft in order that something that's happening behind us can be successful. And those airplanes that's, that are behind us, you kind of talked about a little bit earlier, they may not necessarily be dedicated strike aircraft where they have nothing that they're doing but bombs, but in some cases they're less capable than what we are. So they need to have some sort of air protection in front of them. And that's what a sweep mission really is. And it brings into a play here so many different variables because to your point, yes, we can still sanitize if I'm a striker with my radar, but because of the loadout, And just the brief itself, right? We can't brief everything. So you've got an element, let's say four of you guys in your squadron that are going to be the the screen, rather. And then maybe my squadron has got four of us that are going to do the strike mission. Well, I need to spend time figuring out how I'm going to see the target, find it, attack it. I can't be talking about all the nuances of the air air picture. So that's why it's good. Even though both of us on any given day could do either mission for this particular day, let's get a few guys and gals who are going to concentrate on one and a few that are going to concentrate on the other. Yes, very, very common. I would say the screen, and then as we go forward, some of the other missions we're getting ready to talk about are probably more likely than just the pure sweep missions. And for the reasons you've discussed, you can't do everything everything perfectly. And so uh, sometimes if you try to do too many things at once, you end up not doing any of them really well. True. Okay. So now next up is the, the fighters pretty much right with the strikers, and that is the close escort. What can you tell us about that one? So each of these missions now, the one thing we really haven't talked about is they kind of have an escalating order of risk that goes along with them. When I'm doing a sweep mission, the risk is really only on me. In other words, there's nothing behind me that I need to necessarily worry about. For a screen, there is something behind me, but it's going to be separated by some amount of time. And just as a general rule, you're probably talking in the neighborhood of maybe 40 to 60 miles, or in some cases, five to 10 minutes. And so there is there is some risk involved, but uh, you know I can have the ability to maybe turn around if I've missed somebody or maybe have somebody behind me help to kind of clean up a, a, a uh, adversary fighter if we didn't target them. For close escort, it's really, really different. Now, close escort, you probably have some variation of time or distance, but it's much, much closer. And so I might, in fact, be on top of some strikers that are down low carrying bombs trying to find a target. And I have to protect those guys while still uh, making sure that the enemy does not get to them effectively. So to your point just now, right, so the screen is out in front of everybody a certain amount of time. I guess there's some significance of that, right? Because if a sweep goes out, let's say, a couple hours ahead. Or days. Or days, that's true. Now, there's value to that for sure, but the enemy has time between the sweep and whatever we are doing in whatever strike package we're simulating here. With a screen, now we are compressing that time and we kind of put the enemy on their heels a little bit so they don't have as much time to get a backup generator for something or get some aircraft out of maintenance or whatever. But we're out in front of them and then 10 minutes later, we're, we're bombing them as well. That's right. And to your point, we talk a lot in aviation about, you just mentioned it, about time and distance. And that those considerations and factors are so big in what we're trying to do. And every time I have time where I can be in front of a an asset that's behind me that's trying to strike a target, I'm giving the enemy that same amount of time. So it, it, it goes very, very back to like Sun Tzu and all those other principles mm-hmm. that come out in those type of things. If I have time before my strike comes, so does the enemy. Right. And so for a close escort, what you're really doing is I'm compressing that time, which makes it much more difficult for me, but also makes it a lot more difficult for my enemy. For sure. So Snotty, you said uh, football as an analogy earlier, and I love football analogies on the show. The listeners can tell you they usually don't work. But in thinking about our discussion today, I came up with a different analogy. And tell me if you think this works. So first off, I don't know the first thing about the Secret Service or their tactics, but I can, I think, visualize an analogy here with the Secret Service guys protecting the POTUS, right? President of the United States. So I don't think the Secret Service does this, but a screen would be where they show up a day before where the president's going to be, which they actually do. Mm -hmm. But in this case, in my analogy, they're like roughing people up and beating them up and clearing, you know, windows up in buildings. And, you know, they do all the other part except for the kinetic part. That's right? right. They're not beating anyone up. And then the close escort might be the guys that are maybe 10 or 20 steps in front of the president 
wherever he's going. And then you always see a couple guys next to him that look very serious, and they've got their sunglasses and their earpieces, and those are like the close escort. Exactly right. Okay. Yeah, that's that is a that's a a, a great analogy. So, okay. Except for the the beating people up uh, ahead of <laughs> ahead of time, that's probably fairly accurate to what the Secret Service actually does. And and the bottom line is they're protecting. POTUS, in which in this case would be, you know, something that we, we're talking about, maybe a striker or whatever else. You right. kind of mentioned it before, a high value asset as well. And by the way, all of these missions could be applied to a mission just like that. Sometimes if we have to go out for those high value assets, one of those high value assets might have a person on it, right. not necessarily a thing on it too. Right. So we could do that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And in, you know, in the case of like when Reagan was shot in the eighties, you know, people see the su- secret service pushing him into the car and we didn't really get into it, but in the close escort, a big part of that, and that's a fun mission. I think a big part of that is if you've got, let's say a division of fighters, well, you might only send two off to deal with whatever the threat is. And the other two aren't so much pushing him in the car, but they're kind of staying with almost another analogy is the shepherd and the flock, right? That's right. So, hey, we're going to keep two guys with the flock here and we're going to lean maybe away, but still monitor and, and watch with our radar and other systems. And meanwhile, you two guys, well, no one else is taking care of them. So you're going to go deal with this threat and we're going to keep shepherding, if you will, or close escorting the fighters and try to get to the target if we can. 100% accurate. And okay. another way to think about that too is is by the time you leave the ground, you have the ordnance that you have. In other words, I have all the airborne missiles I'm going to have or I have all the bombs. And each fighter airplane only has so many places that it can put those things. So if I'm loaded out full of bombs in order to be able to strike a target, that just means I don't have that many air-to-air missiles. I probably have right. enough to protect myself, but not enough. And so that's why, as you mentioned, mentioned, those close escort are so important because they're loaded out to be able to shoot down other airplanes. And so sometimes we actually do that. And, it, and it's not uh, it's not without saying that sometimes we actually tell the escort guys, hey, I need you to turn around for five minutes or something because the picture that's in front of us, the enemy threat that's in front of us is a little bit more robust than what we thought. So mm-hmm. let us just go take care of this for a minute. We'll come back and get you when it's safe. We do that too. And spinning the strike package, which is what we would call that, can be very convoluted because if it's at night, oh, people man. lose formation. If if there's something way back behind us that's providing a certain level of protection, maybe in the electronic attack regime or something else, then the alignment can get all screwed up. So yes, anytime you pump the strike package, that's usually a problem. But you got to do it if it's needed because you need a little more time. And everyone doesn't it doesn't have that much gas. So right. when you start turning people around, you've just burnt some time and distance oh, yeah. that you might need. Okay. So unless you can think of any others that I missed, the only other AOCA that I have is a self-escort strike. Tell us about that one. So uh, sounds like you're a fan of the close escort. I am as well. Uh, but my favorite mission is a self-escort strike, probably because it's the one that we as Marines practice the most. In other words, we're going to take a, a C-130 out there, get some gas off the C-130, hopefully put them in a position where they're more protected from the threat. And then we're going to go down range with our intention to bomb a target while carrying air-to-air missiles. So that way, if we see a threat, we can shoot it too. And so we don't have anybody to protect us, and we just go down range protecting ourselves. That is is a super fun mission. But like you mentioned, you have to start thinking about every aspect of all of those missions put together in one mission. And you start doing that at night or in bad weather, that one gets challenging. Well, and we'll talk about mission planning factors in a bit, but this could be a result of an analysis of mission planning factors because if the air-to-air threat is not that robust or the target is easy to find or whatever else, the weather is going to be perfect and it's daytime, you know, there's a host of different factors that can lead you to going to the combatant commander that you respond to and say, hey, you've tasked me to attack this target, like we talked about with Farva way back on air-to-surface weapons. So here's the weapons we're going to use, and here's the way we're going to do it. And one way could be a self-escort strike. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And, and in fact, in the missions that you're seeing today in Iraq and Syria, especially in the Syrian area of operations, most of those aircraft are conducting self-escort strikes with an emphasis on the on the strike package. But mm-hmm. in other words, they all have self-protect air-to-air weapons, especially because they're flying around Russian airplanes. Sure. And the listeners are probably familiar with the episode I recorded with Mongo Mangillo, who shot down a MiG-21 on opening day of Desert Storm. Now, while he did have F-14s out, and they didn't call it this, I don't think, back then, so they probably had maybe a um, pre-strike sweep type of deal sure. or a screen. By the time the MiG-21s got through to them, it was like a self-escort strike because Absolutely. they had sparrows and sidewinders. They vanquished the MiG-21s, and then they made their way and bombed the target and came home. So, yeah, you're right. It is a fun mission. It just can be very task-saturating depending on how difficult the air picture is or 
picking up the target and Perfect. what you're dropping. If you're rolling in, that's one thing. If you have to program a JDAM or find a target on the FLIR before you employ a laser guided weapon, that could be pretty complicated as well. And and I think uh, as we know nowadays. Even with the proliferation of jamming technologies such as GPS jamming and radio jamming and everything else, almost all of our weapons are guided in some way by right. either laser or GPS just simply because we cannot afford any collateral damage that comes with unguided weapons. So exactly what you're talking about, all of those things come with a tremendous amount of planning. It's a different world from World War II when we would send hundreds of bombers and you would hope that a few of them found their way to the target and the rest just bombed everything around it. That's so, right. Yeah, yeah it's the so Society won't tolerate that anymore. All right, so let's move on to defensive counter air. Now, going back to my Secret Service analogy, the president, when he's moving, is kind of that OCA type analogy we used. But let's say he's given a speech. You still see some guys standing in front of the lectern and scanning the threat. So we've got a defensive counter air mission, and we have kind of two subsets of those. What are those? So those two subsets are either an area defense mission or a point defense mission. In other words, I'm either protecting an area, and that area could be rather large or, or maybe not as big, or it's definitely a point defense mission. And for a point defense mission, it could be something along the lines of an airfield. It could be a military base. It could be a nuclear power plant. It could be a lot of point things. For an area defense mission, it's probably something along the lines of uh, something that could be defended by a squadron. And so it's probably a little bit smaller than you think. It might be something along the lines of, say, from Long Beach to San Diego, we're going to defend the coastline there. But again, it comes with a limited duration of time because if I'm putting up a front and here, here's the biggest difference between offensive counter air and defensive counter air for defensive, I don't know when the enemy's coming. And so I need to be prepared no matter what's out there. So I fly in anticipation of them coming. I'm airborne. I'm on that cap the whole time. And so that can be just as mission planning intensive and it can be a uh, pretty difficult while you're in the air. It takes a lot of assets and you may have to break up the threat into lanes. So in your example, if we were defending hundred miles of Southern California, you're going to have probably 10 or you know, so lanes. That's right. Each manned with uh, an element of fighters. Another example of a point defense might be as my analogy with the POTUS is an actual no kidding individual. Yes. And that could be a downed aviator who's waiting to be rescued or just was just shot down and we want to protect that person from any type of threat helicopters that might be trying to recover them. Absolutely. And then the most likely, I would say, area defense, at least for me and my squid background as a Navy guy, would be the carrier strike group. For sure. And so, again, getting ahead to our mission planning, part of that is, well, how much can what we're protecting defend itself? The carrier strike group can do a pretty good job because they have the surface ships with their SM2 missiles, and then even the close-in, last-ditch weapon systems of the carrier and all the other ships. A guy on the ground, he might have his 9 millimeter, and that's about it. That's right. So it really comes down to what are we defending, where is the threat coming from, and when, to your point, and then you do your best to defend it. I would say maybe another analogy for those who enjoy sports would be, it really, it really doesn't work too well here, but, you know, an end zone. Sure. You don't really line people up to defend it. But in football, you've got an end zone. It's a bigger area. But in soccer, what do you have? You have a small goal. That's right. So that's more like a point defense. And yeah. the end zone might be like an area defense. Oh, I agree with that. And, I mean, when you when you look at your average football team, whenever that offensive team that's inside the five-yard line, mm-hmm. those defenders are almost always right there kind of on that line of scrimmage oh, ready yeah. to go. Yeah. And that's very, very similar. Meanwhile, when they're back at the 50 or maybe in the, uh, the opposing team, team side of the field, they tend to be more spaced out. And so I, I definitely think that's a, a good analogy. Cool. All right. So then let's move on to our third mission type for today. And that is the have a P or high value airborne asset protection. First off, what are a couple platforms we might, you already touched on it with an aircraft, maybe with, you know, a certain distinguished person in it, but what, what is normally the assets that we protect? Well, normally you're talking about your airborne AWACS assets, for example, although it could be a tanker. It could be an aircraft that's carrying something. uh, You know, it might be carrying personnel. We kind of already hit on that one, but it might be carrying resupply stuff that we absolutely have to get into the fight somewhere. Mm -hmm. But it's probably going to be those controlling airborne assets like AWACS that you see uh, both in the U.S. Navy with E-2 and then also in the U.S. Air Force with their very large AWACS airplanes as well. Sure. And then, you know, you have other uh, types of airborne assets that we wouldn't want to get shot down to, like we mentioned. And those could be airplanes that can't necessarily defend themselves. Used to be the Prowler, although the Prowler 
Growler's kind of gone the way of the Growler now, and that has a little bit of a protect right. uh, asset to it. But still, you want to protect those type of airplanes that can't 100% go protect themselves. Right, and that's what, as you were talking, I was thinking about was during my career, most of the time we would do a half a P was for the Prowlers because sure. the Growler hadn't quite made it yet. And so to your point... The mission could be just protecting whatever that airplane is. Maybe it needs to get from point A to point B, and you might have to escort it or protect it. Or in the case of our earlier example of a strike package, the front leading edge could be that screen, and the back edge could be a growler with, for whatever reason, maybe you still want to have some have a pee. That is almost a submission of the overall mission. Yes. Because if someone makes it through those other layers, granted, the growler still has pretty good SA compared to the prowler and some missiles, but they're going to be heads down dealing with the surface threat. That's right. So it might not be a bad idea to have a couple bodyguards, getting back to that analogy, on them as well. 100%. And what you just hit on is, uh, I think, something that's very key to this discussion, and that is you can have an offensive mission going on in the vicinity of a mission that would also be classified as defensive at the same exact Hmm. time uh, happening in the same mission. And that happens actually quite frequently. Yep, for sure. And that is a fun one as well. Although a lot of times when I did it, you sit back and you kind of listen and watch everything. And rarely, at least in training, did anyone make it through, but occasionally they did. And then you'd get to peel off and have some fun. Sure. So excellent. All right. So that's OCA, DCA, and have a P. And let's see, the only thing else I've got to talk about are mission planning factors. So there's a lot of different things to consider, but fuel, weather, air order battle, white air, AIC coverage, terrain, defense in depth, risk levels, threat sectors. I mean, there's a ton more. Um, Maybe touch on one or two of those and just kind of walk us through, you know, what we think about when we are planning these missions as far as, so fuel, for example. I mean, you already talked about it. Fuel is always a concern, but depending on how far we go, right, that may affect where we need to place tankers, for example. Always. Uh, in fact, fuel is, at least in the airplane I fly, so obviously we talked about this already, I fly the what we consider to be the Legacy Hornet, so that's F-18A through D. Right. My squadron is uh, supported with F-18Cs, but that airplane has always been and will always be fuel limited. <laughs> in other words, I can only have so much gas on that airplane. We generally fly with two external tanks, which, by the way, takes away two weapon stations, weapon yeah. stations that I can't put bombs or missiles on. But generally speaking, the airplane can hold about very nearly 11,000 pounds of gas, and then I can put about 4,400 pounds on the external. So you're talking about 15,000 pounds of gas, which will give me a combat time, radius and time, of about, say, 1.3 to 1.5 hours. So I need a tanker to be there in a period of time that I can fly with the gas I have to be able to go and get more gas from that tanker. So it is a cyclic operation of where that tanker is in a position where it's also going to be protected and me having enough airplanes that I can cycle back and forth to still do the mission. Well, and yeah, it might be far less than an hour and a half if your left hand gets busy, right? Because if you're an afterburner, it might only be 20 or 30 minutes. That's exactly right. As a matter of fact, for those defensive missions that we talk about, Mm -hmm. we advertise that our on-station time is somewhere in the 20 to 30 minute range just based on the amount of fuel we have. And by the way, now another one of the mission planning factors is what are all the various different airplanes that we have in today's mission or in the mission that we're getting ready to go and do tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And all of those have a fuel limitation. Some have a fuel limitation of four hours. Some, like my airplane, might have a fuel limitation when I'm up on the power, like you said, of 20 to 30 minutes. So every one of those is going to need gas at some point, and refuel and fueling options uh, are so critical. Yep. And it's not just if you hit one number, you're done. If you're far enough over enemy territory, that number may have to be higher because you have to egress all the way back. Absolutely. There's a lot to it. And then for weather, a couple things I brainstormed coming in today was the cons, and we've talked about that on the show before. So if you know that there are contrails being formed behind your aircraft, you want to operate either above or below that. That's right. But just weather in general, right? Absolutely. The weather and the visibility, the temperature, the winds... All of these things are things that we look at before we go and fly. And you mentioned the cons. This might be hard for some of your listeners to believe, but sometimes you fly around, you might fly, and the the con layer might be low, depending on where you are in the world as well. I've seen it, uh, actually, in my time in Canada, I've seen the con layer be essentially at the surface to where just taxiing to the runway, you left a stream of clouds behind you that, in some ways, what we would call weather out the airfield. So when you went to take off, that was pretty tough. 
But you're right. All of those things are huge, huge impediments and factors that you have to plan in. And it kind of goes back towards what you talk about, mission planning factors. It is not uncommon to spend three or four or five times your estimated mission time in planning alone to be able to be successful. That is, that is common. Well, it's just because there's so many different variables and a lot of them are unknown. That's right. So you have to do your best to say, well, if this happens, we'll do this. If that happens, we'll do that. That's right. And so let's just touch on a couple more for fun. How about risk? I mean, how does the allowable risk factor into a game plan, let's say? Well, this is a very close to my heart because as a commander of a squadron, the risk level that I'm willing to take depends on how important it is that my bosses have told me that the mission needs to be accomplished. And if the importance of a certain mission is it goes up to the level of must happen, if that happens, then for me, I'm willing to take more risk in launching, in scheduling and launching those missions. Which is tough for you. Again, I'm sure I never had the opportunity, but you know, I'm sure all the spouses of your pilots. That's right. And you may have to look them in the eye and said, I've sent your spouse off and this happened and that's right. he or she's not coming back. That's, yes. that's, that's good. That gets real. It does get real. It, it gets real all the time. And frankly, we don't try, at least I don't try. And I, I think I think most commanders are this way. We don't try to shy away from that. In right. training and in practice, we try to simulate that as much as we can. So that way, when it comes time to strap on an airplane and go fly in a mission that you know is high risk, that you're not going to have somebody that's not mentally prepared to take that step. Yeah. And that, I mean, gosh, that that is a deep subject there because it comes back to, you know, we know the risks when we sign up for this job, That's just right. like any soldier does. It's you come to terms with your own mortality very quickly, and and you see it, and and it's just part of the deal. So, well, the longer you've go, you you're in this business, the more. Um, I mean, they they say that there's a period of time, and I don't. It's not uh, it's not written down. It's not a, a distinct thing, but there is a period of time after which you will know someone who has either gotten into an accident crashed or or potentially lost their life. And I can tell you that in my own squadron alone, before I took over, there were two incidents just in the past few years where Marines have lost their life. And there's guys in the squadron that knew those people. And so it yeah. is a everyday uh, it's, thought. It's tough. Hey, I wanted to get back to when you talked about the weather to the point of selecting the different tactics or the missiles or weapons or whatever. You know, Obviously, if it's going to be cloudy, we can't be employing laser-guided weapons. Right. And if the winds are such that we didn't plan on 150 knots in our face, well, we're not going to get in there with the fuel. So, again, right. that, that factors into that. And then another thing I thought of was neighboring countries. Some are either friendly or neutral or indifferent, right? That plays in it. And what about white air? Explain that real quick as well. Uh, so those things are uh, a factor. And I could tell you like a great example of what white air might be is, uh, when we were up in, in red flag, uh, conducting that big exercise just a few weeks ago, it was not uncommon for the pre-strike sweep assets to identify an airplane that was flying through the area. In some cases that might be like a hunting airplane, or it might be a U.S. mail airplane, or it might be something else unrelated to the exercise. But when you're amped up and you're looking at an airplane that might be headed towards you at a low altitude, that's the same altitude that some of the threat airplanes are coming at you at, you can't tell the difference between that. Right. So you have to try to distinguish and differentiate between all those different types of things. And that can be extremely difficult to do. And, and so you might have non-playing airplanes or non-threat airplanes that are out there at the same time you are. And it's not open season. We can't just shoot anything that's flying. That's right? right. If it's flying, it's dying. That doesn't work. Nope. Even when you're flying in someone else's country. So if you're right. if you're going into uh, any of the major threat countries that you might think that we would go into, those are not going to be places where it's going to be what we call weapons free. Right. Which I think, I don't know, tell me if you know, like on 9-11, I was told right. it, it was weapons free because was. everything was grounded. So if it was flying... That was the only time. And weapons free just means if it's flying, it's dying. You can shoot but it. But that is, that is very, very rare. That's right. Okay. And then terrain. Now, terrain is important. And we talked about this on the last episode with Niles, because if there is significant mountainous terrain, and we see this when we practice in Fallon, well, then aircraft could be hiding behind that. And they are literally shadowed, maybe from the sun, for sure. That's what most people would think of, but also from our AIC. That's right. So our radars can't look down there. So we might fly overhead at twenty-five or 30,000 feet. 
and up pops somebody hiding below those mountains and they can be a real problem getting back to our shepherd, right? All of a sudden there's a fox in the hen house or whatever. And That's right. that could be a real problem. Well, you, you said they could be um, hiding behind the mountains and I'm telling you they will be hiding behind sure. the mountains. And so that is an adversary tactic. It, it is something that they will do. They will, not only that, but they could be taking off and landing from places that you and I might drive down and look at like highways and roads. And so they might use those unconventional tactics. We already see that. We already know that's a factor in some of uh, the enemies that we see today. And so they will be trying to do those things. They know they probably can't fight us, you know, like a uh, bad boy to bad boy in the, in the backyard of the school. So they're going to try to use unconventional techniques as often as possible to get the advantage. And so while we are planning the mission, we need to identify where those particular blind zones might be and try to maybe either arrange for AIC to come at a different angle or some other system to sanitize down there. But we just don't want to be surprised. I mean, that's, that's really right. what it comes down to is we don't want anything to surprise us because I would argue surprise is probably our worst enemy out there. I mean, obviously the threat can be kinetic and that can be dangerous, but anything where you have to all of a sudden say, oh crud in the moment, right? I didn't plan for this. What do I do? Right. That's usually an issue. It sure is an issue. And obviously that's a big one. We've talked about today, we've talked a lot about different planning things and different missions. But what I really want to stress is when we're going through our planning process, what we're really trying to do is train ourselves so that when you have to make a decision in the air, you're ready for it. And this comes from the most junior pilot to the most senior pilot. We don't ever go out there with a step that says we're going to execute steps one through 10. I might go to step one and then step two is go to step 10. Something might happen which clues me in or tells me that I have to skip from one place to another. And so it's just a matter of prepping myself and so that I'm ready to make all those different adjustments. Isn't there some quote some commander said about a plan is great until the enemy punches you in the face. I'm terrible with quotes. Yeah, that's right. Something that, along those lines. And that is, I mean, we come into any of these missions we briefed today with a plan but then we have all these mission planning factors for, okay, here's what we're going to do if the weather does this, or here's what we're going to do if the threat responds in this way. And so that is the point of the mission planning factors is to engage our brain ahead of time to say, okay, what could possibly happen and how are we going to approach it? And that's because the enemy gets a vote. In that's other right. words, we plan uh, meticulously to the last detail for exactly what we think is going to happen. And then we get out there and in the first 30 seconds, it could be something completely unrelated to what you planned for. And then you have to real time on the fly, execute your tactics based on what you know. Right. Awesome. And there are a ton more mission planning factors. We won't go over all of them, but you know, the enemy order of battle, what aircraft do they have? How do they employ them? What is their surface to air threats? If you were to get shot down, where do you go for friendly territory? I mean, these, all these different things. And that is why, as I've maintained on this show before, that being a fighter pilot requires you to be a professional, like a doctor or a lawyer or anything else, because there's all these different things and you can't just wing it. You've got to Think about them. You've got to have done your homework ahead of time. You can't do it while you're mission planning. And you have to have a squadron standard operating procedure that says that this is how we're going to do things. And then when it comes right down to it, it's go time. You get in the air and you do your best. But like you said, the enemy has a vote. They 100% do. And I can tell you this much. When I get up and stand in front of my ready room and talk to my pilots, I remind them all the time that right now, in some far off land, there is a young pilot and his job is to train to kill you. So what are you doing about it? And I teach my guys that they need to be prepared for what happens tomorrow. And when tomorrow comes and somebody asks us to go and do something, that's not the time to get ready and to study. The time to study was yesterday and the day before. So as I've mentioned, I know it uh, right here in Southern California that whatever my time is, minus eight hours is the time in, in a couple of threat countries that we might go up against. And there's some young guy right now who's probably getting ready to eat his lunch halfway through his day, and he's thinking about killing me. So hmm. I need to be thinking about killing him too. Scary stuff. Someone's got to do it. Yeah, uh, we're well, happy to do it. I'm glad you do, Snotty. So, unless you've got any other thoughts on air to air missions, I think that pretty well covers it as deep as we can go today. I think there's one thing that's that's worth talking about, and okay. that is the evolution of the threat. You kind of hit on it a little bit by the enemy order of battle. When I was a young guy, the F-18 was the leading edge, and so our main threat airplane was the most proliferated airplane in the world, and that was the MiG-21 fish bed. And they had them everywhere. And we were so far more advanced than that airplane that as long as we shot our most advanced missiles, which are typically our AMRAMs and Sidewinders at it, we were going to win. 
And so our tactics were developed that way. Shortly after that, it became the MiG-29 Fulcrum, That's right. an airplane that probably is the airplane you, you and I both grew up fighting. Mm-hmm. And that was one that was, while closer to us, we still had some advantages in some really key areas, and we could fight that thing, and we, we kind of had a, uh, an advantage against that. As we moved on, then it became the Su-27 Flanker, and now, okay, now we had an airplane that probably could beat our airplane in some of its performance characteristics. It had missiles that were closer to being equal to ours. We still had some advantages, though, so we still felt like we could beat that airplane. And then, you know, as you move forward to now Su-30s, again, another flanker, or Su-35, now you have an airplane that exceeds our abilities and capability for the airframe itself is probably carrying a missile that may exceed our own capability for what we fly and has maybe combat systems that are better than ours. And that's not even the latest edge. If you talk about Russian PAC-FA, if you talk about Chinese J-20, now you're talking airplanes that are bridging the gap between fourth and fifth generation. And so what you've really done is taken an airplane like mine, which was the leading edge of Navy and Marine Corps aviation, and we've now said, in order for us to have that same advantage, we now need to be flying F-22 and F-35 for the Navy and Marine Corps and the Air Force as well. So uh, it's been interesting to watch over a 20-year career, the airplane I fly, go from the leading edge to like, "Hmm, maybe it's now it's not going to be in the very front edge of what we do. Still critical though. There could be a parallel there with our own selves here. I'm sorry to say, Snotty. I know it was for me. I was much better then than I am now. That's that's right. uh, I guess I I didn't think about that way, but you're absolutely right. Yeah. I'm old as well. Generations of airplanes and people. All right, dude. Well, I appreciate that wrap up. And that was a really great discussion. I'm fired up, man. I kind of miss it. I (laughs) wish I could go back. I'm jealous of you. You're out there doing it. So what does the future hold for you? I mean, you're in a command. You're in a squadron. I mean, you're you're living the life, but you're going to keep playing the game or you're going to look for an exit? So for right now, I'm super happy where I am, obviously. Uh, I never, ever anticipated that I would become a commander, and I try to remember that every single day when I'm in there talking to my pilots and to my Marines. I am very lucky to have this job. So it's been 27 years for me now uh, in the Marine Corps. It's an actual long time. I've got about another 18 or so, 16 or 18 months left in my command. And so at the conclusion of that, it's time for me to make a hard decision. I'm sure maybe they'll throw another carrot out and and, uh, and their potential will be there to maybe get promoted to a colonel or something. But frankly, it doesn't get any better than what it is right now. And at 48 years old, I'm probably one of the oldest fighter pilots there is in the Marine Corps. And so my wife and I and family are really looking for, you know, it maybe is it time for us to get out? So it's a decision we're going to maybe make around next summer or so, but we're looking at all the options. Okay. Well, we'll keep in touch with you and see how it's going. So you and I are the same age. Are you, are you guys carrier deployed? We're not. The squadron used okay. to be carrier deployed, but we are now a land-based squadron. Okay. Because I can't imagine going doing night traps. So <laughs> let me tell you this. When my, was your last one? My first, first, uh, remember I went to, uh, I right. was a backseater first. So my very first night trap, I was 40 years old. <laughs> and I can tell you behind the USS Nimitz in the Pacific Ocean, I was out there thinking to myself, what am I doing? How does a 40 year old guy get in a single seat airplane behind an aircraft carrier at night? <laughs> Something's wrong. <laughs> Well, you obviously did it well, and we want to thank you on behalf of the listener for your 27 years of service. That's amazing, dude. Appreciate that. And uh, I hope good things continue to happen to you and for you. But before we let you go, Snotty, we need to know how someone came up with that call sign. So when I uh, joined my very first squadron, I had won an award. And the award was uh, in the, uh, when I went through flight school, I had achieved the highest grades over the past year or whatever. And so when I got to my very first squadron. Wait, I have to interrupt. Which time through flight school? The first time. Uh, okay. Yeah, the first time. <laughs> I had, I had uh, won uh, an award for having the highest grades. And so when I got to my squadron, the award had preceded me. And so they had already put it into a standard U.S. military frame, and my CO called me up and did the same thing every CO has ever done to every guy who joined a ready, ready room ever, and that is like, come up and tell us a little bit about yourself. I had been well-trained, and that was like just to come up and say hello and walk back to my seat, and then... Someone said, hey, Skipper, don't we have an award for this guy? And as it turns out, yes, they did. They had an award, and they pulled it out. And, of course, I was mortified and embarrassed. And my CO said, I was reading this award, and like, oh, look, it it says here that you got the highest grades over the past year. So come on up here and get this thing. We already put it in a plaque for you. And as I reached out for it, he took this uh, award and smashed it on the ground and uh, proceeded to kick me out of the squadron, like (laughs) like absolutely kick me out of the squadron, go through the doors, and just stood there as I went through the doors in my check-in uniform, my alpha by the way, and then dismissed the rest of the ready room and they all walked away. 
And so here comes a friend of mine who's like, hey, come on, we're just kidding, no big deal, come on in. And so the next day they gave me the call sign of Snotty, which stands for Student Naval Flight Officer of the Year. <laughs> and uh, and it's stuck with me ever since. So Student Naval Officer of the Year, and that's how I got Snotty. Oh, boy, that's awesome. Yeah, the first day in any squadron is always a challenge, especially when you're brand new. I mean, if you're going later as a department head or something, it's a different story. But It's yeah, fun they, for me now as a fun. CEO, yeah. I get to relive it, uh, but on the other side. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, and I'm guessing things have to calm down a little bit, but... How long has it been since you've had your newest pilot show up at your squadron now? About uh, 10 days, oh. so right before Thanksgiving. <laughs> and we're looking for two potentially new guys before we go on deployment. We, we go to Japan next March. Oh, wow. And so uh, we're getting maybe one, maybe two new guys. But we have a brand new guy in the squadron, and you know we make him wear the big patch and a bunch of other stuff. So it's uh, some of that stuff, as you mentioned, has calmed down, but a lot of it's still the same. You have to earn your right to be in that ready room. And we talked about that on episode two, I believe it was which is we need to find out right away if your skin's thick enough because this sure. is not a forgiving business. It's not. So there's going to be some level level of ribbing and I won't call it hazing or harassment, but we need to make sure your head's there because if it ain't there in the ready room, it won't be there in flight. That's right. So. You have to be able to make the decisions when the time comes and we figure that out by just talking to you and it's more than just being in the airplane. It's the kind of person you are. Yep. All right, Snotty. Well, I really enjoyed our discussion today. So unless you've got any parting shots, I think nope. we can... Wrap it up. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it, and, and, uh, and I'm just happy to be here. So thank you. Awesome. All right, let's get out of here. Jello, wow, what an interview. Snotty, he's pretty eloquent, I'd say, and he kind of, like you said earlier, kind of gets you fired up, man. He is an awesome leader. He's a great he guy. Is. He was very patient with me. It took a couple times to get our schedules to align okay. to record this. And at the end, he was like, hey, if you need some Red Devil paraphernalia for your podcast, let me know. I can donate some lithographs and T-shirts and other stuff. So I'm not quite sure how to handle that yet, but I think we could offer that up to our listeners, maybe as a promotional giveaway or maybe a raffle, and it could go to something we care about. So I don't know. We'll take a look. But yeah, I agree. Awesome, dude. And I'll tell you what, the uh, so a long time ago, is in 2006, I got to cruise with the Red Devils, obviously not okay. in their squadron, sure. but the amount of uh, esprit de corps, whatever you want to call it, was oh, yeah. amazing. And when we actually, when we were out in Singapore, in port, all the fellas, all the, the, the pilots there in, uh, in 232 actually had polyester red suits. <laughs> And they walked around en masse, and they would go like, uh, just, it was an amazing sight to see oh, these, I can these, imagine. these uh, big, beefy Marines running around in bright red outfits. So awesome. good on them, good yep. on them. And I don't know, I kind of muddled, I think, my explanation of the Secret Service analogy at the beginning. So hopefully when everyone heard it, they figured it out. But what I meant, again, was the crew that shows up a day or two in front of the president would be like the sweeps. And then the folks that are 10 or 20 steps in front when he's moving somewhere are like the screen. And then the guys right next to him are the close escort. So hopefully we got through that. And then at some point we introduced, we had talked about sweep, but and then all of a sudden pre-strike sweep came out. And that's not really necessarily its own mission like the others, but we will sometimes use that terminology for a sweep that is farther than a screen, but not a day or two before. So those guys might go out 30 minutes ahead, okay. but not 10 and not two hours or not two days either. So it's, it's a little bit closer. And we just threw that terminology and I didn't realize it until I listened while we were editing. Nice. All right, bud. Well, golly, we are getting to the end here. What else have we got? Yeah, let's see. So we're getting toward the end of the calendar year, which is also the holidays. Yes. Right? So I wonder if we should try to knock out an episode with our wives, showing kind of the, the wives aspect. Yes, indeed. So we've been scheming this, you and I, for a long time, and it looks like it's going to finally work out. And in fact, it wasn't just our own idea. We've had several listeners say, hey, we'd like to know what it's like from the home front. So mm -hmm. you and I and our lovely brides have that planned here soon. I thought we would play that. That one on December 21st while everyone's feeling all warm for the holidays anyway. <laughs> and then at some point, maybe at the end of the year, we should do like a year wrap up. Maybe just not have a guest, just kind of sit back and wax poetic on this past year. Okay. What we liked, what we didn't, what we learned, and what our plans are for 2019. In the meantime, really? though, you and I need to get our heads together on what we're doing for the next episode, because right now I don't have anything lined up. So I don't know if you've got an idea. We can certainly talk off tape, but we'll get something out there for the folks on December 11th. And then we've got hopefully the home front on the 21st and then maybe a year end wrap up at the end of the year. What do you think? I think that's a great idea. We have had some other feedback. And thank you once again very much for all the feedback we get on. Uh, hey, what if we did an episode that's a little more technical? Yes. So we could talk about, hey, why a hornet looks like it does or right. whatever. So, mm -hmm. so maybe that'll be coming out shortly. We'll see. And then, you know, we'll talk about 
2019 on whatever year end wrap up we may have but people have been asking hey can you get someone to talk about the a10 can you get someone to talk about the harrier so next year the plan is to have episodes where each one is dedicated to an aircraft and i thought it'd be fun to have the same five or six questions that we ask everyone just to kind of put it in context absolutely even if one of them is what armament does it carry and we're talking about the c5 galaxy it might be you know nine millimeter pistols i don't know <laughs> but anyway so we'll do that as well and, and again we'll, we'll get that ready for folks at the end of the year but speaking of feedback you still have been knocking out of the park with your facebook posts people really enjoy answering questions you had one recently about the mig 29 yeah uh so all i'm gonna say is schlaren photography got it okay got it. yeah it's pretty cool Excellent. All right. And then one final thing is we've mentioned this before, but if you are doing some holiday shopping or if you need to give people ideas for you, the military aviation enthusiast, well, we would recommend you go to fighterpilotpodcast.com, click on the shop link, and there you can find a smattering of apparel with our themes on them or household good items. Uh, Sunshine, we're in your house today and I notice you're lacking the Cobra throw pillow, so I may I have to buy you some of those. For <laughs> and a shower curtain. And the shower. Well, I didn't go into your bathroom. So. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, those items are available. Great for man caves. So if you know Absolutely. someone who's getting their man I'm cave working ready. on one. Yep. And then again, our friend Bowl over at Velatus has wine that's deliverable to most of the states. And as well, if you're not already supporting a charity with your Amazon purchases and you want to support us, click through the shop Amazon link and it costs you nothing extra, but it gets us a little affiliate revenue and that helps keep Fantastic. the show going. You bet. Every little bit counts. That's right. Well, I want to remind everyone that the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of the hosts and our guest, and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. Well, I think that'll just about do it then, Sunshine. Indeed, Jello. Let's get out of here, and we'll come back hopefully in 10 days or so. Sounds like a plan. All right. See ya. See ya. Thank you for listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Got a question for the show? Send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to check out our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com. You can also find us on all the usual social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. For exclusive Fighter Pilot Podcast content and to help support the show, visit our Patreon page. Please like, follow, and share us with your network. And if you have a moment to leave us a rating or a review on iTunes, we would greatly appreciate it.